while all the children join us down for, for the children serving. <laughs> Stand up, and I'm going to ask 
your Bible drill leader, your mama, uh, Deanna Linegar, to come up front. Yes, and she is also my wife. That's true. That's true. That's true. Not get anything past you. That's right. But we want to present something to Leanne and just to remind all of us how important it is to study the Bible, to learn passages in the Bible. And so I'm going to have you present that to her. No, not the bag. What's in the bag? This is a trophy, and it's set. Uh, can you can you read that? 2016 State Bible Girl winner, Leanne Lindgren. She worked very hard um, to uh, to learn all the verses, and then the pressure of standing in front of people and being timed. And she did a great job. So, everyone, thank you, Dan, for working with her and all your work. So, what I would like to do this is Children's Day, and I think it's important for us as adults to pray for you guys. So, I'm going to ask all the children that are sitting here can stand up and then just make a line. Facing the congregation. All right. If there's any other children that are here that like to join us, I'm going to lead us in a prayer for these kids. We're going to put our prayer, our hands of blessing upon these kids, just where you are. And what I would like for you to do is is just sitting where you are. If you could just raise your hand uh, to, toward one of these kids while I lead us in prayer. And so this is going to symbolize us putting our hands of blessing on these kids. If you could do that now, just raise your hands and put your hand toward these kids as we pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we put our hands of blessing upon these children this morning and ask that you bless each child richly along with their families. Remind each one that they are a part of the family of God, not just the church of the future, but the church right now, as this morning they share their gifts and their talents in worship. Father, I pray that you might guide their parents as they do their best to guide their children. And as we have all gathered in this place to worship you, remind us that in your eyes, we are all the children of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Children's choir, begin in place for your song.
Thank you. That's our tech department, and this is our IT department. <laughs> if you need help with your phones, just hand them to them. They'll show you exactly how to, how to work. We are just a few weeks away from one of our signature events here at the church. And um, someone is coming to talk to you about it. The most dangerous thing I ever do is give uh, Christy a microphone. Um, but she is going to share a word of testimony today with us. I mean, really? Do I look dangerous to you? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> no, it is my privilege to share my auction testimony this morning. Many of us speak about the festival as if everyone should know about it. The Middletown Festival occurs during the second weekend of September. The festival begins on Friday afternoon and ends Saturday night. I always love it that Friday afternoon when you come down Main Street, or actually the week before and they put the signs out. The road will be closing. Oh, I get so excited. I really care. <laughs> it is an event that traditionally draws up to 40,000 people to the areas immediately outside our church building, including Weatherby Park, which is kind of behind you and over here to your right, the parking lot to your left over here between this building and Celebration Hall, and all along Main Street, from down by the Methodist Church, almost down to Mark's Feed Store. Many of you have had the opportunity to participate in the festival, but for those of you who have not, let me try to describe it. Think Mayberry, USA. <laughs> Weatherby Park is full of booths with vendors, arts and crafts, and food. Corn dolls, funnel cakes, frozen lemonade, pork sandwiches, can you smell it? There are inflatable bouncies for the kids, a dog show, live bands and entertainment all day long, a parade complete with marching bands, school kids, politicians, fire engines, and parade floats. Can you see it? Imagine an atmosphere where the kids are running around enjoying the late summer weather, wondering if this year they are finally going to be old enough to walk around without their parents. That's kind of become a rite of passage for the kids here at First Baptist. Families gather on the front porch of the church because it's a great place to see the parade and later the fireworks show. Can you hear it? The festival is some of the best stuff our community has to offer. It's Middletown shining bright, and First Baptist Church is literally right at the heart of it. Many of us like to say it's the most wonderful time of the year. Our soda shop selling ice cream delights. The children's booth giving all the little ones a chance to win big prizes. The oasis tent, a place to rest and relax in the middle of all the buzz. A parade float that always fills us with pride. And Broadway on Main, a free musical theater production featuring actors, musicians, and the cutest kids you'll see on stage anywhere. Are you praying for it? The Festival Auction is an annual fundraising event that allows all of these exciting things to happen without using any budget money during the Middletown Festival. Not only does the auction underwrite the expenses of the church's participation in the festival, but also helps with other projects, including property improvement, outreach, providing scholarship for children and youth for camps, and more. My real purpose today is to encourage you to think about ways you can participate in the Festival Auction. The auction is Saturday, July 9th at 6 o'clock in Celebration Hall, which is our building across the lot here. The Festival Auction Committee works tirelessly to make this a remarkable event. The evening includes a silent auction, free food and beverages, delicious desserts for sale by the slice, a duck pond where you spend $20 and get a gift card valued at at least $20 or more, and of course, a live auction event with fabulous items you want to take home. There's something for everyone, and as with most successful events, it takes everyone to make it a success. Many hours of work and dedication go into the planning and production of the auction event, which has annually raised about $20,000. Man, that's some auctioneer, just saying. <laughs> The festival committee needs your donations of items for the auction. Antiques and collectibles, jewelry, a week at your timeshare, tickets to sporting events, gift cards, 
and many other items are needed. We need you to invite your friends and family to join us for the event and advertise it in any way you can. And we need you to be there, joining in the fun and sharing in the fellowship. I was asked to give my testimony, and here it is. I love the festival. I love it because it allows First Baptist Church to use our gifts collectively in a way that I think brings honor to God. It allows us to show our community that being a part of church is fun. It gives us a way to say God loves you to people who might not otherwise walk through the doors of our church. And personally, it gives me a way to use my gifts that brings me great joy. I hope to see you all at the auction in July. Please stand as we sing, I stand amazed yes. and present.
share the needs of our church family. And Ms. Brooke is going to lead us in our prayer. I do want to uh, remind you that we are lifting up Daryl Elster, uh, the, loss, the loss of his father. And we're also praying for Tish Nowler and the loss of her brother. And we're praying for Dottie Martin, who was hospitalized this past week, uh, but has been released and was going to try to make it here this morning. Did she make it? Is she here? There she is. And we're, we're continuing to pray for you. We're glad that you're out of the hospital and back here with us. Uh, I know you also bring with you unspoken prayer requests. If you have an unspoken prayer request, if you could please raise your hand all over the room. God sees our hearts and he knows our, our minds and I think already he's answering those prayers. I'm going to turn it over to you, Brooke, as you lead us in our time of prayer. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for our church family. Please be with the ones that have special needs today, those who are sick or lonely or just need a spe special touch from you. Thank you for hearing our prayer and knowing our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I want to recognize some of our folks who work so hard with these kids. Our Sunday school teachers, our staff, our uh, mission teachers. Um, if you are any part of these kids' lives here at church, uh, Wednesdays or Sunday, stand up and let us say how much we appreciate you. balcony so you all down here didn't get to see her and um, but it, it wouldn't happen we have great children's leadership but it wouldn't happen if parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles that didn't get the kids here so if you're a parent a grandparent or a transporting aunt and uncle of one of these kids stand up and let us appreciate you Realize it takes extra effort to get kids here by 6 10 on Wednesday nights after school, homework, dinner, and to get them here so they can be in these programs. And we appreciate, the whole church appreciates what you are doing. I don't think it's an accident that John, when he writes his epistles, says to the church, All of us are God's little children. I, it may be a term of endearment. It may be because John is old. He's a senior pastor, a bishop over area churches in southern Turkey. But I think, so he sees all of them as his children. But he says, that is what we all are. I don't know about your kids, but thinking about mine, they are economically dependent, aren't they? Um, mine are at the stage now of that I need gas money. <laughs> um, children have limited understanding. It's a good thing, isn't it? That they don't have to understand everything about life that we understand. They are physically weaker. You remember when your children are little, how they can get sick of a drop of a hat? And all of a sudden they spike this 103 temperature and you didn't even see it coming. And they couldn't tell you. And just as fast they get well again. So they're physically weaker and they're vertically challenged. It's a little hard for them to reach stuff off the top cabinet. That's why we're going to miss a Baylor leaving our house this fall. Because he grabs things that are up high for us. And these children want to be loved and nurtured. They, they want to be cuddled at times. And so John says everyone, all Christians are the same way. We are dependent on others to provide for our needs. I know we like to think of ourselves as self-made. The reality is none of us can be self-made. Uh, just a very simple thing. We are dependent on somebody fixing the, the roads. We don't live in an island. You, when those uh, potholes appear, we're dependent on someone coming to fix the potholes or clearing the accident so we can get where we want to go. We claim we're independent, but the reality is we are all like children. We are dependent on someone else. We have limited understanding. I have a list of questions for God in heaven, and you probably do too. I don't understand everything that I want to understand. We are aware of our physical limitations. As kids, we see them uh, bounce around and just like they don't, gravity doesn't affect them. You've seen them how they, how they run the, the bases of the ball field. Um, they're unaware of some of their, under, their limitations, but as we become older, we become very aware of our physical limitations. And we, we want to be loved and noticed. I don't care what age we are. We want someone to know that we exist. So John writes to church. And in this third chapter of 1 John, he writes them for three reasons. He wants them to become aware of their human condition. That we all have a tendency to be childish. 
not childlike, to be childish. That our self-interest really ends at the end of our noses. We all have a tendency towards selfishness, self, um, uh, selfishness. But at the same time, we are all created in God's image. And so we have this war in us, even as adults. This self-interest pulling us into ourselves and this creative nature of God that pulls us out into his world. John wants them to become aware, secondly, of Christ's sacrificial love for them. Um, I'm always careful how I use the word love. Because we think love is just really, really intense life. At some point, I really stopped liking you a lot and I started loving you. And it, it's an emotion for us. But in the New Testament, it's never an emotion. It is an intentional sacrifice. So that, I, I can't say that Jesus is crazy about you. Way your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend is crazy about you. I don't. I won't be able to say to you that he just can't wait for you to show up and make his day. But I will say this: he intentionally chooses to make a sacrifice for you. Christ's love for us was a choice he made that cost him more than any of us would be willing to pay. And the third thing is, John wants us to become aware of how easily we can all slip into sin. That's that selfishness, always bringing us back to the mirror. It starts small, that little pet sin that we just keep private, and then it mushrooms out of control. And we tell a bigger lie to cover a smaller lie and a bigger justification to carry us to cover a smaller justification. Before we know it, our sinfulness starts ruling our lives. And so John wants to protect his children. To protect all of us to say, be aware of your sinfulness. Know of Christ's intentional sacrifice for you and guard your heart. The reality of church life is that all of us struggle. All of us struggle. But our struggles are not the same struggles. Little kids struggle. I was watching one of our children this morning having a really bad day. Little children struggle. The grown-ups struggle. We have days where we think, why am I still doing this? Why is this still happening to me? Black people struggle, and white people, and Hispanic people. Fat people struggle, and skinny people struggle. Old and young, and Republicans and Democrats and Independents and Baptists and Catholics and Mormons and preachers and technicians and homemakers and attorneys and engineers and retirees, we struggle. Life presents us challenges that we cannot overcome on our own. So what is John's solution for that? These, these words on the wall behind me, I think, are John's message for us. As we serve together, we grow together. As we live in community with each other, we overcome our struggles together. To sacrifice intentionally for each other is the most basic requirement. When John says love each other, what he's really saying is make sacrifices for each other. Because of Christ's sacrifice, we make sacrifices. 
We make choices to set aside our wants and needs for others to find what they need. I just have three ideas for how that happens in church life. How we grow together and serve together. The first one is we pay attention to each other. A few weeks ago, I um, had to go up to the AT&T store for um, something for Bennett's phone. We had to replace uh, something, a little, uh, one of the children was telling me that little thing, whatever that little, that little card is called. Same card. Thank you. Teaching uh, Jamie. Thank you. And so I had on a Campbellsville uh, polo shirt, university polo shirt, and I teach adjunct for them some, and um, I would say that one of the benefits is you get a free shirt, but I had to buy, even buy my own shirt. <laughs> so the young man that waited on us there said, oh, you go to Campbellsville? I said, well, I, I teach long. He said, I'm a graduate of Campbellsville. as a Master of Theology from Campbellsville. I said, really? You're working at AT&T? Yeah, I'm working at AT&T. <laughs> we started talking, and his name is Chuck, a great young guy. And I said, I gave him my card, and I said, I, I think you've got a story that you may want heard. And so, um, at any time, I'll buy your lunch. And so Friday, we had lunch. He called me. He said, I, 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 I want to talk. A uh, great young guy, very experienced in church life. Wife's a, a therapist, a, a social worker. And, and I think he wanted somebody to hear his story. I'm hoping that they'll come and stay with us some while he's searching for the next church position. I think all of us want someone to listen to our story. But that means that being part of a church is being intentional asking for the story. Listening. Being willing to build a relationship with people that are total strangers to us. Pay attention to the divine something. That's a word from Longfellow. Longfellow has a book of sonnets, and one of his um, series of sonnets, he wrote in tribute to three friends who had died. They, they'd gone to college together, and as each of them died, he wrote a sonnet about them. And in that sonnet, he said, I have seen that divine something. To know each other, enough to see that divine something in every human being. To know what it is in these children. What is that divine spark in them? All of these kids are just as special as they can be. They're great kids. But I threw a Landon curveball. I said, uh, during the children's sermon, I said, Landon, I got $1,000 here. And um, it's from Mr. Grease, and it's 51000 Can you say that? Yes, sir. <laughs> and boy, he was as smooth as silk. <laughs> Reuben Welsh wrote a book that I was given in high school, and I still have it. A dog got a hold of it at some point and chewed it all up. And I have to kind of pry the pages apart. But I got it out this week because it's a poetic commentary on 1 John. And he says in the book, your world changes when someone pays attention to you. It doesn't matter whether you're a grown-up or a child. When I was, we used to have junior boys. Remember primaries and juniors and intermediates? Some of you are old Baptists like I am. You remember those days. My junior boys Sunday school class teacher was um, Miss, Miss Abby, Ava Nichols. I met a little girl the other day with the name Ava. These old names are coming back. I said, you were named for a wonderful lady. I thought she was 120 years old. And she had junior boys. 
and a tiny little, kind of mostly just a closet. But that was our Sunday school classroom. And she kept a list of all of her boys that she had for the years. Not her, not her class role, but just her own list. And when she died, her boys were all of her Paul parents. And I did her service. Miss Abby paid attention to four or five little eight-year-old boys. And she changed our lives. The second thing I want to say to us today out of this text is that as we grow and serve together, we have to connect with each other like children connect with each other. Children connect by playing together, by being curious, by crying together, and laughing together and spending time together. Um, one of the great things about the festival <coughs> is not exactly what happens outside on the parking lot. It's a ton of fun. It's a great weekend. We get ready all year for it. We spend a lot of money, no budget dollars. We spend a lot of money on the weekend. But one of the greatest things that happens is the 60 or so members of the cast and the crew, and the orchestra, and the children, starting uh, mid-July, we'll start rehearsing. And we spend time together. And, and we eat together, and, and we laugh together. And when someone hurts, we cry together. That's church family. That's how we support each other. We spend time together in the same place. Just like children, we grow together as we live together. And the third thing I want to say out of this text on growing together and serving together is that living in the Christian family says that we run from the sin that separates us. Each one of us makes conscious, deliberate efforts to live our better selves. To step away from gossip and backbiting, self-centeredness, and stepping toward our Heavenly Father and the church family. To constantly reunite with God and His love for us. And rather than running away from God's family, we run toward God's plan. God's plan for us is that we would serve together and that we would grow together. John says, all of you are my little children. And just like these kids up here today did it in such a beautiful way, they are reflecting us. What you saw them do is what they've seen us do. So we be the church that these kids will carry into the next generation. Let's pray together. <coughs> Our Father, it is a holy trust that you have given to us. Help us be aware, O oh God, that these children are watching every step we take. And they're watching how we act, just not toward them, but how we act toward each other. And we ask, oh God, that you would make us the church you want us to be. Help us to be aware of our own childlikeness, our total dependence on you. Help us to be aware of how easily we can slip away. Help us to be aware of others who need us to include them in our lives. Well, God, today, we ask you to bless these children and their homes, their families, but we ask you to bless our church as we do our very best to both model for them and instruct them on your plan for us. We pray in Christ's name. Our worship today concludes with an invitation to you.
to publicly profess your faith in Christ, perhaps for the very first time, or to unite with the church, whether through the waters of Christian baptism or from, uh, by uh, a letter from a church of like faith and order, we'll figure all of that out. But we invite you to come and be a part of our church family. We're going to stand together and sing an invitation hymn in just a moment, and David's here, and I'll be here. Today may be the day that God is laying on your heart. It's time to open my life to Christ and to his church. We'll be here to receive you. Let's stand together and sing. <laughs> Thank you. 